T-minus 16 seconds. Sound suppression water system has been activated, protecting Discovery and the launch pad from acoustical energy. We have a go for main engine start. T-minus 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery, hoisting harmony to the heavens and opening new gateways for international science. Discovery has cleared the tower. For thousands of years, mankind has looked toward space. But it's been less than a century since we could actually travel there. Discovery's roll maneuver is complete. A few centuries ago, almost all scientists believed in the biblical account of creation. However, by the time the first astronaut launched into space, many scientists had abandoned this history. Many astronomers had come to believe that our solar system and the planets and moons within it formed all by themselves without a creator about four and a half billion years ago. But what did we find when we arrived in space? Do the planets and moons of our solar system actually support this belief? Or are they consistent with the Bible instead? The answer to this question might surprise you. Welcome to What You Aren't Being Told About Astronomy, Volume 1, Our Created Solar System. I'm Spike Pissaris, your host. For a number of years, I worked as an engineer in the U.S. military space program. I entered that program as an atheist and an evolutionist. I left it as a creationist and a Christian. In this video, you'll discover some of the evidences that have convinced me, along with many others, that the Bible is true and evolution is not. I'll be your guide as we tour the solar system together. We'll see stunning pictures and movies of planets, moons, and other objects. Some are our next door neighbors in space. Others are vast distances away. We'll discover that often these objects do not support evolutionary ideas. Many of them appear to be quite young, not billions of years old. In fact, according to the current evolutionary models, many of the objects in our solar system cannot exist at all. Now that probably contradicts everything you've heard before. You've probably been told that evolutionary astronomers have it all figured out and that their models prove that our solar system formed all by itself billions of years ago. Well, you'll have to hear the evidence and judge for yourself. In this video, you'll discover what you're not being told about our solar system. So let's get started. Before we can talk about how our solar system got here, we need to clarify exactly what the solar system is. When we talk about the solar system, we're talking about our sun and everything that orbits around it. This includes the eight major planets in our solar system, along with many moons, asteroids, comets, and some smaller objects as well. By the way, this diagram is not to scale. In this video, we'll be discussing all the planets and some of their moons in our solar system. In order from the sun, the planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto is a special case that we'll be discussing later. Here's what the planets would look like if you could line them all up next to the sun. In real life, the planets are much farther away from the sun and each other than this, but I wanted to show you how big the planets are compared to each other in the sun. By the way, you are here. So where did the system come from? There are two competing models for the origin of our solar system. This is a pretty straightforward issue. Either the solar system was created or it wasn't. In this video, I'm going to use the word evolution to describe the belief that our solar system was not created. This word is often used to describe biological evolution, of course, but astronomers commonly use it in a broader meaning as well. So when I use the word evolution, I'm not talking about plants or animals. I'm talking about the belief that our solar system and everything in it formed and developed all by itself. I used to believe in evolution, but not anymore. I now believe that the entire universe and everything in it, including our solar system, was created by God as described in the Bible. Of course, many scientists today disagree strongly with this idea. These men and women believe that no creation occurred. They believe that the solar system formed billions of years ago without a creator being involved. In this video, you'll discover why their model is wrong. Of course, this won't prove that the creation model is right. It's impossible to use science to prove any historical event happened. All we can do is see which scenario fits the evidence the best. And that's what this video is all about. Most people have been told that all the evidence points toward evolution. As we tour the solar system together, ask yourself this question. Are the planets and moons consistent 
with these evolutionary ideas or not? I think you'll see that the answer is no. I think you'll see that the evidence is perfectly consistent with the creation viewpoint instead. So let's discuss these two opposing models. The creation model is based on the Bible. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible doesn't give us a specific date for this event, but from other passages in the Bible, we can calculate that this would have been about 6,000 years ago. On the other hand, someone who believes in evolution denies the biblical account. The dominant evolutionary model today is called the solar nebula model. According to this model, our solar system formed from a swirling cloud of gas and dust about 4.5 to 4.6 billion years ago. The evolutionary story goes something like this. In the beginning, there was gas. About 4.6 billion years ago, an enormous cloud of gas collapsed and started to swirl. Most of the gas went into the middle and became our sun. The rest of it swirled around the new sun and started to condense into grains of dust. As the grains of dust orbited the sun, they started to stick together and became clumps of dust. Then the clumps stuck together to become little rocks. The little rocks stuck together to become big rocks. After enough time had passed, the gas had turned into huge asteroids. These asteroids stuck together to become the planets we see today. Astronomers have a special name for these asteroids. They're called planetesimals, which means little planets. Since you probably haven't heard this word before, I'm going to call them asteroids instead. It means basically the same thing anyway. For example, most secular astronomers believe that the asteroids we see in our solar system today are leftover planetesimals that never quite got it together to form planets. Evolutionists are confident that their model is correct. After all, it explains why all the planets orbit the sun in the same direction. It also explains why the solar system is flat today, with all the planets lining up in a disk shape as they orbit the sun. Plus, it explains why the inner planets are rocky, and the outer planets are made of gas and ice. Supposedly, the heavier rocky materials were able to condense close to the sun, while the lighter materials were more volatile and could only condense further away from the sun. Sounds good, doesn't it? The problem is that it doesn't work. It turns out that you can't build planets like the evolutionists say. You can build clumps of dust, certainly. We know that dust particles stick together. Just look under your furniture and see the dust bunnies there for proof. Well, experiments in space have shown that dust bunnies will form in a vacuum, too. The problem is that once you have big clumps of dust, and maybe even some small pebbles, they don't grow together anymore. They start impacting each other too fast to stick together. Instead, they start breaking each other up in the collisions. Gravity isn't strong enough to overcome this until after the rocks have formed into small asteroids. So, despite the fancy computer animations you see on science videos, there's no way to get from dust clumps to planets. Evolutionary astronomers know this is true. That's why you see quotes like this one in the astronomy textbooks. Once these planetesimals have been formed, further growth of planets may occur through the gravitational accretion into large bodies. But just how that takes place is not understood. And in the scientific journals, we see comments like this. The formation of planetesimals, the kilometer-sized planetary precursors, is still a puzzling process. How the first stage of this process, primary accretion, works is a fundamental unsolved problem of planetary science. So before we even discuss any planets or moons, the evolutionary theory is breaking down already. It can't produce the asteroids it needs to build the planets. Will it do any better when we examine the actual planets and moons themselves? Let's take a look and see. We'll start our tour with the planet that's closest to the Sun, Mercury. Mercury is the first of the four terrestrial planets. The others are Venus, Earth, and Mars. The word terrestrial comes from terra, the Latin name for Earth. Unlike the large gas planets, Earth is mostly rock. Since Mercury, Venus, and Mars are also rocky, we call them the terrestrial planets. Mercury is tiny. It's a little bigger than our moon, but smaller than some of the other moons in our solar system. It's also a planet of extremes. Since it's so close to the sun, the temperatures on Mercury can reach about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, more than enough to melt lead. On the dark side, temperatures can plunge to 200 degrees below zero. Mercury's surface resembles our moon. It's heavily cratered, as you can see here. We've learned a lot about Mercury in just the last few years. 
Before 2008, most of what we knew about Mercury came from the Mariner 10 space probe, which flew by Mercury in 1974 and 1975. Even back then, Mercury posed multiple challenges for evolutionary theories. Mariner showed that Mercury was very dense. So dense, in fact, that most scientists believe it has an iron core occupying over 40% of its volume. This poses a huge problem for secular theories. Evolutionary models say Mercury can't be this dense, not even close. As one secular astronomer explained, the driving force behind previous attempts to account for Mercury has been to fit the high density of the planet into some preferred overall solar system scheme. It has become clear that none of these proposed models work, and the high density is conveniently accommodated by the large impact hypothesis, which makes Mercury unique. Okay, so this problem is solved by the large impact hypothesis. What is that exactly? Well, evolutionists believe that Mercury did actually form in the way evolution predicts, but then this happened. Do you remember all those asteroids that were supposedly flying around in our early solar system, turning into planets? Well, after Mercury formed in the correct way, the way that secular models predict, one of those asteroids crashed into Mercury and stripped away all the lighter material from it. The lighter stuff just wandered off into space somewhere, leaving behind the dense material that we see in the planet today. But where's the evidence for this event? Only that if it didn't happen, Mercury would disprove evolution. Obviously, this isn't a good standard of evidence. But that's not all. The Mariner probe also discovered that this little planet has a magnetic field. But according to evolution, it can't have a magnetic field. To understand why this is important, we need to talk about magnetic fields for a moment. There are several reasons why a planet could have a magnetic field, but most of them require the planet to be young. Since evolutionists believe that the planets are all billions of years old, this means there can be only one source of magnetism for the planets, a dynamo deep inside each planet. A dynamo means there is hot, liquid metal moving around inside each planet. As it flows, an electrical current is produced, which creates a magnetic field. This is a complicated process, so I won't bore you with details. The important thing is this. In order for a planet to still have a magnetic field after billions of years, it has to have a liquid core. But, as one evolutionist has pointed out, Mercury is so small that the general opinion is that the planet should have frozen solid eons ago. Therefore, according to evolution, Mercury can't have a liquid core. So it can't have a magnetic field. But it does have a magnetic field. After this discovery, evolutionists tried to account for this with new models. But these models all introduced new problems of their own. So that was the situation after the Mariner mission. Then, in 2008, the Messenger spacecraft arrived at Mercury, our first in-depth study of the planet in over 30 years, and we got a treasure trove of new information. Evolutionists had hoped that the new data would solve their problems. Instead, the problems became far worse. Messenger created several new challenges for secular models. First of all, Messenger found that Mercury has a lot of volatile elements, like sulfur and potassium. This discredits the large impact hypothesis, because these elements are very volatile. A violent collision like this would have vaporized these elements. They would have escaped into space, and they wouldn't be on Mercury today. But they are on Mercury today. Therefore, there was no large impact, and evolutionists can no longer explain Mercury's large metallic core. Second, Mercury appears to have lots of sulfur, a higher concentration than any other rocky planet. This sulfur causes other problems for evolutionary models. The nebula theory says that volatile elements like sulfur can't be there. As one study noted, chemical condensation models indicate that sulfur cannot condense in the primordial solar nebula at the heliocentric distance of Mercury. But there it is on Mercury anyway. Third, Messenger found that Mercury's magnetic field is decaying. It decreased by almost 8% in just 35 years or so. At this rate, it loses half its strength about every 320 years. If Mercury were really billions of years old, it shouldn't have a magnetic field at all. Now we see that it not only has a field, the field is also decaying rapidly. This makes the field look very young, like the planet was initially magnetized just a few thousand years ago. It can't have been decaying like this for billions of years because it would have been impossibly strong far less than one million years ago. By the way, the decaying field was not a surprise to creationists, because a physicist named Dr. Russell Humphreys had predicted it ahead of time, 
based on the creation account in the Bible. We'll talk more about his predictions later in this video. Lastly, Messenger found other forms of evidence that Mercury is young. This planet was supposed to be an old, burned-out cinder, but that's not the case. One major surprise was this completely new feature on Mercury, these blue hollows. These have been called this jaw-dropping thing that nobody ever predicted. These are pits and depressions, up to a few miles across. Scientists think these form when volatiles escape Mercury's surface in various ways. Many of these hollows appear quite fresh. Apparently, whatever process creates them is still going on today in some places. Again, if Mercury were really billions of years old, these processes would have ceased long ago. These hollows make Mercury look quite young. So here's what you're not being told about Mercury. Evolution says it can't be dense, but it is. Evolution says it can't have a magnetic field, but it does. Its high amounts of volatile elements like sulfur contradict secular models about how Mercury formed, and the decaying magnetic field and ongoing geological activity make Mercury look young, not billions of years old. As one evolutionist wrote, Mercury doesn't conform to theory and is not the planet described in the textbooks. Mercury is a tiny planet, but it causes huge problems for evolution. As it says in 1 Corinthians 1.27, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Venus is not the closest planet to the sun, but it is the hottest. Venus is completely covered with clouds. These clouds are mostly carbon dioxide. This traps the sun's heat and causes a massive greenhouse effect. Temperatures on Venus approach 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Beneath its clouds, Venus looks like this. Venus is not a nice place to visit. If you were to go there and could somehow survive the heat, which you couldn't, and could somehow breathe the air, which you shouldn't, you'd immediately die anyway. You'd be crushed by the 90 atmospheres of pressure. At Venus's surface, the pressure is the same as being 3,000 feet deep under the ocean on Earth. Venus poses many unique challenges to evolution. Scientists used to call Venus our sister planet, which makes sense. After all, Venus is about the same size and mass as the Earth and is made up of the same stuff. According to evolution, Venus was formed by the same processes as the Earth was, at the same time, in about the same place, and from the same materials. Therefore, Venus should be very similar to Earth, but in the last few decades, we've learned that Venus is actually very different. First of all, we've discovered that Venus's surface is not at all what evolutionists expected. Venus looks like the biblical description of Hades. There's no water anywhere. Instead, the entire planet is covered with lava flows. It does rain sometimes, but the rain isn't water. It's sulfuric acid. Also, Venus seems to have no tectonic plates. The Earth's crust is made up of many plates, but Venus's isn't. Venus has no magnetic field either, while the Earth does. If evolution says the planets are supposed to be so much alike, then why are they so different? For that matter, why doesn't Venus have a moon? Later in this video, we'll talk about how the Earth supposedly got its moon. For now, we'll ask, if both planets really did form at the same time, by the same processes, from the same materials, and at about the same place, why doesn't Venus have a moon too? Well, an evolutionary theory explains this. Supposedly, Venus did have a moon initially, as evolutionary models would expect, but then something happened. Yes, that's right. An asteroid came along and hit it and destroyed Venus's moon. Where's the evidence for this, though? There isn't any. Only that if it didn't happen, Venus would pose problems for evolutionary theory. Venus poses other huge problems for evolution as well. For example, Venus's surface appears quite young. The entire surface appears to be fresh. There's no record anywhere of billions of years of erosion or chemical weathering. Evolutionists are forced to speculate that somehow, for some unknown reason, the entire planet was resurfaced by volcanic activity not that long ago. This means the entire planet's crust would be submerged under lava all at the same time. Why did this happen? Nobody knows. How did this happen? Nobody knows that either. But it must have happened, they say, because we know evolution is true. How long ago did this event supposedly happen? 
Most planetary scientists believe Venus was resurfaced about 500 million years ago. They believe this because Venus has about a thousand large impact craters on its surface, and it would take 500 million years or so to accumulate this many craters. So even though they admit Venus's surface looks young, they will insist that it's at least 500 million years old. But they're making two big assumptions here. Number one, they're assuming they know how often new craters form today. And number two, they're assuming this rate has been the same for at least 500 million years. However, both of these assumptions have been shown to be invalid. Studies on our moon and elsewhere in the solar system have shown that the evolutionary cratering model is wrong. We'll talk more about that later in this video. We see then that even though evolutionists insist Venus is old, all the evidence we have makes it look quite young. So here's what you aren't being told about Venus. Evolution says it should be similar to Earth, but it has no moon, no magnetic field, and its crust and its surface are very different than Earth's. Its surface is young and fresh, and Venus is perfectly consistent with a solar system that's only thousands of years old not billions. The Earth is obviously very special to us. It's our home. Evolutionists tell us that our home has been here for about four and a half billion years. But there's a lot of evidence that says this can't be true, that the Earth was created just a few thousand years ago, as the Bible says. In fact, there's enough evidence to fill multiple videos like this one. So a later video in this series will focus exclusively on the age of the Earth. For now, we'll have to reluctantly set this topic aside and move on. Let's talk instead about the Earth as a planet. Other than its age, does it match evolutionary theories? No, in many ways it doesn't. First of all, Earth's magnetic field causes all sorts of problems for evolution. Our magnetic field looks sort of like the field that would be generated if there was a giant bar magnet inside the Earth. Of course, there is no bar magnet inside of our planet. So where does the field come from? We've already discussed how magnetic fields are supposedly generated by fluid motions inside the planets. We've also discussed how this idea doesn't necessarily work, especially for Mercury. Well, it's hard to make it work for the Earth too, even though the Earth is the planet it was invented to explain. The American Geophysical Union website quotes a study that says this, The mechanism for generating the geomagnetic field remains one of the central unsolved problems in geoscience. An even bigger problem, though, is that our magnetic field is decaying. For as long as we've been measuring it, its energy has fallen continuously. It loses half its energy about every 1400 years or so. Now you might have heard that the Earth's magnetic field has flipped in the past, that North and South magnetic poles have swapped. That's true, but it's not what we're talking about here. We aren't talking about the strength of the field at any one place on the Earth. We're talking about all the energy in the field overall, and that energy is fading fast. Since it's getting weaker over time, this means it was stronger in the past. If you could travel backwards in time, the field would double its energy every 1400 years you traveled. Of course, there's a definite limit on how strong it could possibly have been. It turns out that the Earth's magnetic field could only be tens of thousands of years old at the most, not thousands of millions. Oh, and evolutionary dynamo theories can't explain any of this, of course. That's why one evolutionist recently wrote, Magnetism is almost as much of a puzzle now as it was when William Gilbert wrote his classic text concerning magnetism, magnetic bodies, and the great magnet Earth in 1600. So, despite 400 years of research, evolutionists can't figure out how the Earth could possibly have a magnetic field. Maybe we should just accept that our planet was created? In fact, our planet looks like it was created especially for us. The Earth is uniquely designed to be our home. First of all, the magnetic field that evolutionists can't explain has a very important function. It protects us from solar radiation, which would quickly kill life on Earth otherwise. Charged particles from the sun are deflected around and behind us instead. Not only that, our atmosphere nurtures us and gives us air to breathe. A thicker atmosphere, or one with a different composition, could produce a massive greenhouse effect instead. Next, the Earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours. 
This again is a unique feature for us. If the Earth rotated too slowly, there would be extreme temperature changes on our planet. If it rotated too quickly, we would experience violent winds, but it rotates at just the right speed. Also, our planet's axis is tilted by 23 and a half degrees. This gives us moderate seasons. Plus, the Earth's orbit is nice and circular. This gives us a stable climate. But none of this should surprise us. The Bible says in Isaiah 45, 18, that God created the Earth for us to live here. For thus says the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. There's another very important feature of our home planet. 70% of its surface is covered in water. We don't appreciate just how much water there is here, but from certain angles, like this one, looking at the Pacific Ocean, it's hard to see any land at all. In fact, it's hard to even comprehend how much water is here. The ocean basins are miles deep in some places. Question, if you could raise the ocean bottoms up and squish all the mountains down so that the entire Earth's surface was perfectly smooth, then obviously the water in the oceans would spread out to cover the entire Earth. But how deep would this water be? The answer is over a mile and a half. There's a tremendous amount of water here, more than enough to flood the entire planet if only the Earth's surface was a bit smoother. So next time you read in the Bible about Noah's flood, remember how much water there is. Skeptics often scoff and say, if there was a global flood, where did all the water go? Well, they can just go down to the ocean and look at it. It's still there. Even the Earth's mountains used to be underwater, as the evolutionists themselves admit. That's why we find marine fossils on mountaintops. But at the end of the flood, the ocean basin sank and the mountains rose. That's why there's dry land today for us to live on. Anyway, back to our discussion about water. All this water is vital to life. But did you know that evolutionary models say that this water shouldn't be here? Remember how we discussed that volatile gases couldn't condense in the inner solar system? The evolutionary model says they were blown outwards instead. Evolutionists say this is why the terrestrial planets are rocky, because lighter materials couldn't condense this close to the sun. Well, one of the things that shouldn't have condensed this close to the sun is water. Evolutionary models say that the Earth had to form with practically no water at all. Obviously, that's not what we see. Where did all this water come from? Well, evolutionists don't know. They used to claim that the Earth was bombarded with hundreds of millions of comets early in its history. Since comets are basically big, dirty ice balls in space, they said this is where all our water came from. Unfortunately for evolution, this explanation doesn't work anymore. We've actually sent spacecraft to visit some comets recently and found out exactly what these things are made of. It turns out that comets do contain some water, but a lot of their ices are chemically different than the water we have on Earth. Comet ices have a lot more deuterium than evolutionists expected. Since deuterium is extremely rare on Earth, apparently our water didn't come from comets. Therefore, according to the secular model, our planet should have very little water. But this is not what we see. Now some secular astronomers claim that this problem was solved recently. In 2011, the Herschel Space Observatory discovered that a comet named Hartley 2 has water that more closely matches the composition of Earth's water. Some secular websites are now claiming that comets could have been the source of Earth's water. But this is incorrect. You can read more about this at creationastronomy.com. Overall, the evolutionary model still can't explain how the Earth has water on it. And that's why some secular researchers are now invoking asteroids as the source of Earth's water. These scientists point to asteroids like 24 Themis, which was recently discovered to have water frost and ice on its surface. They say that long ago, millions of asteroids crashed into Earth and supplied its water. But this idea runs into problems right away. Asteroids are rocky, not icy. They have far less water than comets do. And even the ones that do have some water have the wrong chemical composition to have supplied water to the Earth. As one study concluded, probably less than 15% of Earth's water could have come from these asteroids. Add it all up, and the secular model predicts that our planet should have very little water. Obviously, the secular model is wrong. As a report in Science News recently said, there's one thing on which most geochemists and astronomers agree. 
the celestial pantry is now empty of a key ingredient in the recipe for Earth. So here's what you aren't being told about the Earth. It's uniquely designed for us to live here. It's rotation period, axial tilt, orbit, atmosphere, and many other things. There's plenty of water here for Noah's flood, but evolution says there shouldn't be any here at all. And the Earth's magnetic field can't be billions of years old. Engines on five, four, three, two. All engines running. Launch cruise, lift off. We have lift off 49 minutes past the hour. Just having reports the clock has started. The tower is clear. The Apollo missions to the moon were probably the highlight of our entire space program so far. Thousands of people worked tirelessly for years so that 12 men could walk on the moon and return safely home. We've all seen the moon countless times. Often, we tend to take it for granted, and we don't appreciate its beauty. But there's much more to appreciate than just its beauty. Like the Earth, the moon was created and uniquely designed for us. First of all, the moon's gravity raises tides in the Earth's oceans. This is crucial to life on Earth. The moon's tides help to circulate ocean water, which prevents our oceans from becoming stagnant. This allows fish and other creatures to live there. The moon is at just the right distance for this. If it were much farther away, it wouldn't raise high enough tides. On the other hand, if it were much closer, the tides would be too high and they would be harmful to us. But the moon was created for more than just tides. The Bible says the moon was created for signs and seasons for us here on Earth, and it's uniquely positioned for this. As the moon goes around the Earth, it regularly passes between the Earth and the Sun. When this happens, if you're at the right spot on the Earth, you can see an eclipse. Notice how the moon blocks out the Sun exactly. The moon is 400 times smaller than the Sun, but the Sun is 400 times farther away than the moon. This makes these eclipses possible. As you see here, it also allows us to study parts of the sun's atmosphere, things that we couldn't see otherwise thanks to the sun's blinding light. A total eclipse is known to be one of the most awe-inspiring events in all of creation. Each time one occurs, people travel from all over the world to see it. There are well over a hundred other moons in our solar system, yet none of them produce eclipses like this for the planets they orbit. Only our moon has the exact combination of size, position, and distance that produces these beautiful events. We'll call, we'll call you. Except for the Earth itself, the Moon is the most widely studied object in our solar system. It's the only other object that people have walked on. The Moon has some fascinating lessons to teach us. The side of the Moon that we see from Earth is dominated by several features. The large dark areas that you see here on the surface are called maria. These are believed to be large flows of hardened lava. Here's a closer look. Notice how the mare area is smooth and lower than the rugged highlands behind it. The maria are believed to be huge impact basins. Sometime during the moon's past, some large objects hit the moon, forming these huge basins. These impacts were so severe that they cracked the moon's crust, causing lava to ooze out and fill the basins in. This seems like a reasonable explanation so far, but here's a question. How much time passed between the impacts and the lava coming out? It seems obvious that this wouldn't have taken long at all, a few hours, a few days, maybe as long as a week or two. But evolutionists believe that 500 million years passed in between the impacts and the lava. Why do they believe this? Because in many places on the moon, we can see things called ghost craters. Ghost craters are craters that are sticking up from underneath the maria. They have been partially filled in by lava, but not completely erased. That's why we can still see them. Here's another example. Notice that some craters are sharp and clear. These obviously formed after the lava filled in the maria, so these are not ghost craters. The ghost craters are the ones, like these, that are peeking up from underneath the hardened lava. These craters existed on the floors of the impact basins before the lava came and partially filled them. This means they formed after the giant impacts happened, but before the lava came out from the impacts. 
Here's why this is important. Because evolutionists believe in billions of years, they have concluded that, except for a short period early in the solar system's history, new craters form very slowly. Otherwise, there would be a lot more craters on the moon's maria, for example. But there are a lot of ghost craters on the moon. Since evolutionists have to believe in a slow rate of cratering, they're forced to believe that it took a good 500 million years or so for all these ghost craters to form. Does this idea make sense? No, it doesn't. Obviously, such huge impacts would have had an effect on the moon immediately. It's ridiculous to think that the moon would wait a half billion years or so before it reacted to these collisions. The only reason evolutionists believe this is because they're committed to their billions of years. But if we look at the evidence without being influenced by evolutionary prejudices, what do we see? We see evidence that cratering rates used to be a lot higher in the past than today. And this affects our understanding of planets and moons all over the solar system. We talked about this during our look at Venus. Remember, Venus's surface looks very young, but evolutionists say it's at least 500 million years old because cratering is such a slow process. Our moon shows us that cratering is not such a slow process as evolutionists believe. And that means the planets and moons in our solar system are a lot younger than you're being told. As we look at the moon, many people have wondered, how did the moon get here? Where did it come from? Well, the Bible tells us clearly where it came from. It was created on day four of creation week. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. The moon was made to mark out times and seasons, and to rule the night. Indeed, it is the dominant light in the nighttime sky. But evolutionists don't want to accept creation, so they look for other answers. In fact, Evolutionists were very excited about the Apollo moon program back in the 1960s for just this reason. They thought that the lunar missions would help them understand how the moon could have formed all by itself without a creator being involved. This is Apollo 17 astronaut Harrison Schmidt. He was not only the last astronaut to walk on the moon, he was also a PhD geologist as well. Schmidt and the other astronauts gathered samples from the moon's surface and brought back hundreds of pounds of moon rocks with them. These rocks revealed some very interesting things about the moon. At the time, there were three main evolutionary theories for the origin of the moon. Evolutionary scientists were eager to analyze the moon rocks and see which of their theories was right. The three theories were the fission theory, the nebula theory, and the capture theory. Let's talk about each one. The fission theory said that the early Earth was spinning very rapidly. Then a chunk of material tore off and became the moon. This theory had problems, though. Tests showed that lunar rocks are different than Earth rocks in some important ways. For example, the Moon is deficient in iron when compared to the Earth. Also, if this idea was true, the Earth would have been spinning incredibly quickly. It would have been rotating just once every two and a half hours or so. Problem. How did it slow down to today's speed of once every 24 hours? All that excess spin energy would have had to have gone somewhere. Calculations showed that this amount of energy would have been enough to raise the temperature of the entire Earth by a thousand degrees Celsius. This would have boiled away all the Earth's oceans. Therefore, since we still have oceans today, we know this theory is wrong. The nebula theory said that the Earth and Moon formed out of a swirling cloud of gas and dust. This is just like the overall evolutionary theory for our solar system, with the gas turning into planets, but just on a smaller scale. The problem here is that this meant the Earth and Moon were formed from the same stuff, and the Apollo missions showed that moon rocks are different than Earth rocks. There are also real problems in getting the Earth and Moon to form from a cloud like that. The third theory was the capture theory. This says that the Moon formed elsewhere in our solar system and was traveling along one day when it passed too close to the Earth. The Earth's gravity pulled it in, or it took up housekeeping and started orbiting our planet where it is today. There are several problems with this idea. The biggest one is that one object can't capture another one gravitationally like this, not without interacting with other objects, too. If it were just the Moon approaching the Earth, then the Earth's gravity would have accelerated the Moon on the way in. By the time the Moon arrived, it would be going too fast to stay in orbit. So there would only be two options. Either the Moon would hit the Earth, or else it would zoom on by and get flung away on the other side. 
Either way, you don't get an orbit. So, the Apollo missions left evolutionists in a turmoil. It's interesting to read their debates from the time. None of the evolutionists could really argue, well, my theory is right, because each theory had fatal flaws. Instead, they all said, well, it can't be any of those theories because they're obviously wrong. So in a sense, they were all right, because they were indeed all wrong. A few years after the Apollo missions ended, a NASA publication said this, in spite of everything that we have learned during the last few years, we still cannot decide between these three theories. We still need more data and perhaps some new theories before the origin of the moon is settled to everyone's satisfaction. What does it mean when you have several theories already, but you need some new ones? It means the ones you have are wrong. So evolutionists needed something new. Sure enough, a new theory soon came to the rescue. Yep, it's those asteroids again. You see, billions of years ago, a really big asteroid, one the size of Mars, crashed into the Earth. Both the asteroid and the Earth were broken up in this catastrophe. Lots of material was sprayed out into space. Some of it formed into the moon, and the rest of it came back down, back into the Earth. However, the iron from both bodies sank into the Earth's core. So this explains why the moon doesn't have much iron today. So how good is this theory? Well, the media will tell you that computer simulations have proven it to be true. But that's nonsense. First of all, computer simulations can never prove anything happened, only that it's one possibility for how something might have happened. Secondly, this model only works with very narrow parameters. You need an asteroid of exactly the right size, coming in at exactly the right speed, and exactly the right angle, for this to be even possible. And there's lots of debate about whether or not it works even within these narrow boundaries. Even many evolutionists don't accept this model. For example, one evolutionary astrophysicist has complained, the collision has to be implausibly gentle. You practically need someone to hold a Mars-sized object just above Earth and drop it to avoid messing up Earth's orbit. Not only that, scientists recently took a closer look at some of the soil samples that astronauts brought back from the moon. They discovered that some of the samples contain water. This was a complete shock to evolutionists. The giant impact theory says that the moon can't have any water today. It would have been vaporized and lost during the collision. As one scientist commented, it's hard to imagine a scenario in which a giant impact melts completely, the moon, and at the same time allows it to hold on to its water. That's a really, really difficult knot to untie. Thanks to this new discovery, the giant impact hypothesis is in serious trouble, and that was the only idea that was remotely possible for an evolutionary origin of our moon. Sounds like evolution can't explain where the moon came from. The Bible was right all along. This shouldn't have surprised anyone, though. All along, there's been a lot of evidence that the moon can't be billions of years old. For example, this is the Aristarchus Plateau. This is one of many locations on the moon that have been controversial for a long time. For centuries, people have seen flashes and temporary glows of light in these locations. These events don't last long, so it's been very difficult to photograph them. But we have written accounts of them going back to the 1500s. It seems that the moon is still geologically active, releasing gas from volcanic vents. This is the Eratosthenes crater, another location where unusual sightings have occurred. Evolutionists have rejected all these sightings as nonsense. In their models, the moon's volcanic activity stopped about 3.2 billion years ago. The moon is old, cold, and dead. It can't be geologically active, or so they've always said. Finally though, all the accumulating evidence became too much. In 1968, NASA released its chronological catalog of reported lunar events. This report listed 579 separate sightings of anomalous events on the moon. A couple of years later, the Apollo 15 mission even measured radon gas coming from the Aristarchus crater. Apparently, the moon is still geologically active. This makes perfect sense if it was only a few thousand years old. It's not old, cold, and dead, after all. The funny thing is, for the most part, evolutionists still won't admit any of this. In 2006, a study was published that said, well, we used to think that all geological activity stopped there 3.2 billion years ago, but now we admit we were wrong. It continued until 10 million years ago. They just have to stick with the millions of years. They just can't admit that the moon is young and that its geological activity is still going on today. After all, if the moon was young, then the Bible would be right, and they don't want that. There's still one final problem with the evolutionist model that we haven't discussed yet. 
When our astronauts went to the moon, they brought lots of experiments with them. One of those experiments was called LLR, or Lunar Laser Ranging. These were special mirrors that the astronauts left behind on the moon. These are the locations where the Apollo missions landed. Apollo 11, 14, and 15 were the three missions that left behind the LLR reflectors. The reflectors look like this. Scientists on the Earth can fire a laser at one of these reflectors, and if the laser hits the target directly, which is really hard to do, as you can imagine, but they are able to do this, then the laser bounces back to Earth. Scientists then measure how long the light took to return, and then they figure out exactly how far away the moon is from us. This is still being done today, by the way. It's the only Apollo experiment that's still going on. Here's why this is important. Scientists have discovered that the moon is moving further away from us every year. This was already suspected before Apollo, but now we've been able to measure it. So why is this happening? It's because the moon is raising ocean tides on the Earth. This causes our ocean to bulge towards the moon. However, the Earth is spinning underneath the bulge and pulling it forward. The bulge itself then exerts a gravitational pull on the moon, which accelerates it and moves it outward in its orbit. That's a complicated process, but don't worry about the details. The important part is this. The moon is moving away from the Earth at about 3.8 centimeters per year. That's about an inch and a half each year. We've measured this for years, and we know exactly why it's happening. An inch and a half per year doesn't sound like much, but the way this works, it would have been receding faster in the past. Looking backwards in time, the moon would have been much closer to the Earth than today. In fact, calculations show that the moon would have been touching the Earth only one and a half billion years ago. Obviously, this is impossible. Obviously, the moon can't have been orbiting the Earth for four billion years as evolutionists claim. By the way, I should mention that evolutionists have been trying to solve this problem. There are some articles floating around on the internet that say this isn't a problem for evolution anymore. But those articles are wrong. If you're curious why, you can go to www.creationastronomy.com for details. So here's what you're not being told about the moon. Evolution can't explain why it's there. Evolution can't explain why it's still geologically active and evolution can't explain how it could be receding for billions of years. What the Bible says about the moon is true. The moon is young and designed just for us. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. We first landed a spacecraft on it successfully in 1976. Since then, we've sent many other probes and have learned a lot about the red planet. Mars has turned out to be a rocky desert. Even though it's much smaller than the Earth, it has some very dramatic terrain. This is Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. It's about the same size as the state of Arizona. Mars also has the largest canyon in the entire solar system. This is the Mariner Valley, or Valles Marineris. This enormous rift valley is as long as the continental United States. It's over nine times as long as the Grand Canyon, about seven times as wide, and four times as deep. It's almost as deep as Mount Everest is high. Mars is probably the planet that's in the news most often. You've probably heard about all this evidence for water on Mars that keeps getting discovered. Some evolutionists even say large parts of Mars used to be flooded with water, maybe even the whole planet. Let's talk about that for a moment. Many formations on Mars look like they were formed by liquid water. There are chasms, gullies, layer deposits, shorelines, and other formations that flowing water can produce. There's also evidence for water geysers and other dramatic events. But Mars is a giant desert today. Sometimes it has dust storms that cover the entire planet. How could there have been flooding on Mars? Mars does actually have water on it today, but not in liquid form. For example, there's water vapor in the atmosphere. More importantly, Mars has a lot of water ice at the poles. Water is also frozen under the surface elsewhere on the planet. This would seem to be the source of at least some of the formations we've seen. For example, a volcano or some other event that heats up the surface sufficiently could melt the ice frozen into the surface and cause flooding. 
but how long could this liquid water last on the surface? Under current conditions, it can't last long at all. That's why Mars is so dry today. Mars has a very thin atmosphere. This means the boiling point of water is very low. Even though it's very cold on Mars, a puddle of water would evaporate away quickly. Despite all this, evolutionists speculate that Mars used to have huge oceans of liquid water, which lasted for hundreds of millions of years. Why? Because they want to find life on other planets, and they need liquid water to do it. They seem to think that finding life somewhere besides Earth would prove evolution. Well, that's absurd in multiple ways. First of all, water doesn't mean life. You need water for life, but you also need lots of other things, especially an intelligent designer who can create it all. Louis Pasteur already proved that life can't arise from non-living chemicals, and that was over 150 years ago. Evolutionists need to update their scientific approach. Even if we did find life on other planets, that wouldn't prove evolution anyway. Evolution can't explain how life arose at all, anywhere. For example, one evolutionist wrote this, more than 30 years of experimentation on the origin of life in the fields of chemical and molecular evolution have led to a better perception of the immensity of the problem of the origin of life on Earth, rather than to its solution. At present, all discussion on principal theories and experiments in the field either end in stalemate or in a confession of ignorance. Another evolutionist admitted this, It is extremely improbable that proteins and nucleic acids, both of which are structurally complex, and both of which are required for life, by the way, arose spontaneously in the same place at the same time. Yet it also seems impossible to have one without the other. And so, at first glance, one might have to conclude that life could never, in fact, have originated by chemical means. I could give lots of other examples, but we don't have the time. My point is that evolution can't explain how life could have started without a creator. Yet evolutionists are always looking for life somewhere else, as if that would help them solve this problem. But finding life somewhere else would just increase the number of places where evolution can't explain it. Anyway, that's one of the main reasons evolutionists want to find evidence for water on Mars. Unfortunately for them, as I mentioned before, liquid water is impossible on Mars today. But evolutionists want a history of water there really, really badly. This creates a huge problem. And where there's a problem, you need a solution. Evolutionists believe that Mars used to have a thick atmosphere, like they want. But then an asteroid hit the planet and stripped it away. Let's think about this for a moment. Mars is a desert planet where it's physically impossible to have water. But evolutionists desperately want water there. In fact, they want enough water to flood the whole planet. So they invoke this catastrophe for which there's no evidence. On the other hand, the Earth has lots of water more than enough to drown the entire planet a mile and a half deep. And the Bible confirms that all the land was underwater at the time of Noah's flood. Plus, there's lots of physical evidence for a global flood on our planet. But evolutionists mock us for accepting the biblical account. They say that believing in a catastrophe is unscientific. Do you see the hypocrisy here? This is a vital point. In this video, you'll see that evolutionists invoke catastrophes over and over again to fill the gaps in their models. And to be fair, it's possible that catastrophes have played a role in shaping the planets and moons in our solar system. After all, the Bible doesn't tell us much about the history of these objects, so we can't be dogmatic about what did or didn't happen to them in the past. Nevertheless, there's usually little evidence for any of the collisions invoked by the evolutionists. In the history of the entire solar system, there's only one catastrophe that we know for sure occurred, a global flood here on Earth. And this one catastrophe, the only one with overwhelming evidence from geology, history, and the Word of God itself, this catastrophe, the evolutionists reject absolutely. That's why in this video I'm emphasizing how often the evolutionists use asteroid collisions to rescue their models from the facts. Again and again, they invoke speculative catastrophes all over the solar system, but then they ridicule creationary scientists for using a well-supported catastrophe to interpret geological formations on Earth. And Mars is a perfect example of this inconsistency. Evolutionists are demanding watery catastrophes on Mars, where there can be no water today. Yet they mock creationists for believing in a watery catastrophe on Earth, which is covered with water today. As I said, this is utter hypocrisy. Mars is also an excellent illustration of the rank speculation that is passed off as science today. For example, perhaps the preeminent scientific journal in the world today is Nature. 
Nature recently ran an article with this headline, Wheel of Spirit Hints at Life on Mars. The spirit being referred to here is a small rover that we landed on Mars. So if all you saw was this headline, you'd think, wow, spirit found evidence for life on Mars. But what exactly did spirit find? Only a little patch of sandy material, which might be silica, which might have formed from a volcanic fumarole. And on Earth, volcanic fumaroles sometimes have bacteria in them. Bingo, we found evidence for life on Mars. Isn't this absurd? A patch of sand somehow becomes hints of life on Mars. If a creationary scientist said something half this silly, he'd be mocked and ridiculed. But evolutionary believers do this sort of thing all the time. They often come up with wild speculations, which are presented as scientific fact. Remember this the next time you hear a news story about evidence for water, or even life, on Mars. Or about all the evidence we have for evolution here on Earth. Try to find out what the evidence really is. It's often a lot less persuasive than they say. So here's what you aren't being told about Mars. Evolutionists want a long history of global oceans on Mars, but it's physically impossible for liquid water to exist on Mars today. The evolutionist view of Mars reveals the hypocrisy of their approach. And Mars is a good example of the wild evolutionary speculations that are passed off as science today. Jupiter is sometimes called the king of the planets. It's the largest planet in our solar system. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are giants too. They're all much bigger than the Earth, as you can see. But Jupiter is by far the biggest. Jupiter has beautiful, intricate clouds swirling over its entire surface. It also has a famous feature called the Great Red Spot. The Red Spot is a huge storm system swirling on Jupiter. This has existed for about as long as we've had telescopes to look at it. So it's hundreds of years old at least. It might even have been there since Jupiter was created, for all we know. As you can see, this one storm is bigger than the entire Earth. Jupiter also has huge electrical storms on its surface. Jupiter is a violent place. Just like all the other planets, Jupiter confounds evolutionary models of our solar system. To produce a planet this big, you need a lot of raw materials and the evolutionary model can't supply them. According to the evolutionary model, Jupiter had to form a bit differently than the Earth. Like the Earth, it supposedly started when some planetesimals, or asteroids, formed from the solar nebula and gathered together. But unlike the Earth, these planetesimals had enough mass, and therefore enough gravity, to collect lots of gas from the solar nebula too. Then, after several million years of gas collecting, Jupiter had formed. Well, that doesn't work for several reasons. First of all, as we've already seen, the secular model can't make asteroids out of gas and dust. As one paper commented, the process by which sub-micrometer-sized protoplanetary dust particles evolve to kilometer-sized planetesimals is still enigmatic. Another admitted that the process by which planetesimals could form is unknown. In fact, not only are there problems building large asteroids, the models can't even produce small ones. As a JPL NASA press release explained, the problem with this tidy little theory is that when the burgeoning space rocks grew to about one meter in size, orbital mechanics tells us the gas co-mingling with them in the protoplanetary disk should have acted like a brake, slowing their velocity appreciably. Their orbital speed having been cut, these filing cabinet-sized space rocks would have spiraled into the sun. So even if small planetesimals managed to form, they would have been destroyed fairly quickly. As a paper in Nature pointed out, how this process continues from meter-sized boulders to kilometer-scale planetesimals is a major unsolved problem. Boulders are expected to stick together poorly and to spiral into the protostar in a few hundred orbits, owing to a headwind from the slower rotating gas. So the secular model can't make planetesimals. But without planetesimals, the secular model can't explain any of the planets, including Jupiter. And even if you could make planetesimals from gas and dust, secular scientists have discovered that they still couldn't explain Jupiter because its chemical composition doesn't match their models. Evolutionary models say that Jupiter should have very little of certain elements, argon, krypton, xenon, and others. But we've discovered that Jupiter has about three times as much of these elements as evolutionists had expected. 
According to secular models, Jupiter can't have these elements in the concentrations that we observe, because those elements can't have been in Jupiter's region of the solar system back when Jupiter was forming. According to the models, the only place that these elements are allowed to have formed is way out beyond the orbit of Neptune, more than 3 billion miles from where Jupiter is today. To try and solve this problem, some evolutionists have suggested that Jupiter must have formed way out there and then moved inward. But this doesn't make sense for several reasons. Among other things, the secular model says there wouldn't have been enough material out there for Jupiter to assemble from. Others have suggested that the unexpected elements came from planetesimals, or asteroids, that formed way out there and then moved billions of miles inward, delivering these elements to Jupiter. But that doesn't work either. If they had formed out there and then moved in, they would have warmed up as they moved toward the Sun. And as they got warmer, they would have lost whatever argon, krypton, and xenon they contained. As some secular researchers commented, it remains to be shown how planetesimals that formed at the very low temperatures required to explain the observations could have found their way to Jupiter. The secular model can't account for Jupiter. The planet as we see it today just shouldn't be there, but there it is. An article in the scientific journal Nature discussed this problem. An overview of that article said, Jupiter is the largest of all the planets, but results in Nature now reveal the embarrassing fact that we know next to nothing about how or where it formed. Overall, according to the secular model, it seems that Jupiter shouldn't exist. But of course it does. As one report said, Talk about a major embarrassment for planetary scientists. There, blazing away in the late evening sky, are Jupiter and Saturn, the gas giants that account for 93% of the solar system's planetary mass, and no one has a satisfying explanation of how they were made. Well, that last part isn't true. The Bible has a very satisfying explanation of how they were made. But now that evolutionists have rejected the Bible, their only explanation for these planets is lots of shoulder shrugging. Jupiter has over 60 moons. They pose problems for evolution too. Let's take a look at the four biggest ones. From upper left clockwise, we have Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. Ganymede is the largest of Jupiter's moons. It's even bigger than the planet Mercury. Ganymede has one of the most bizarre surfaces in our entire solar system. It's crisscrossed with ridges and grooved terrain, but with weird patterns streaking across it all. Some places are rough and rocky. Other places are flat and smooth. It almost looks like somebody took a giant paintbrush and painted huge swipes across the surface. But this isn't the only challenge Ganymede poses for people who try to explain how it formed without a creator. Evolutionary models predicted that Ganymede couldn't have a magnetic field. But when our space probes arrived and started taking measurements, we found that it does have a magnetic field. Ganymede doesn't match the evolutionary model at all. Then there's Callisto. This moon is the most heavily cratered object in the solar system. Evolutionists believe that it has one of the oldest surfaces of any object, about 4 billion years old. It was a real surprise then, when our space probes took some close-up pictures. Evolutionists expected a large number of smaller craters to go with the big ones. But they aren't there. They should be there if the surface is really billions of years old, but they're not. Callisto doesn't match the evolutionary cratering model. Not only that, some of the pictures show what appears to be fresh ice on Callisto's surface. This means that there's still erosion and geological activity going on. Evolutionary models say that Callisto is old, cold, and dead, but apparently that's not true. Next, there's Europa. Europa is, in some ways, the opposite of Callisto. Callisto is the most heavily cratered object in the solar system. Europa is the smoothest. Not only are there very few craters, Europa has very little terrain of any kind. It's almost perfectly smooth. The entire moon is covered with a shell of ice. The ice is several miles thick, but some scientists believe there might be liquid water beneath it. And where there's water, there has to be life, right? We already talked about how ridiculous that idea is, but nevertheless, you still hear it in the news a lot. Somebody finds a new crack on Europa and thinks, ooh, look, water might ooze up into the crack and there might be life evolving in the water. Then some reporter runs a story about it that says we're on the verge of finding life elsewhere in the solar system, even though all we found was a crack in a moon. That sounds ridiculous, but it happens a lot in astronomy, unfortunately. Because Europa has only a few craters, we've been able to study them closely. 
One recent study has shown that the evolutionary model for cratering is all wrong. We've talked about cratering before. We've seen that evolutionists like to use craters to date things in the solar system. After all, the more craters something has, the longer it's been sitting there getting struck by other objects. Well, this study discovered that the impact of just one object can throw up debris and form lots and lots of craters. Scientists had already known this was possible, but evolutionists didn't expect the effect to be this large. The study showed that up to 95% of small craters and a lot of the medium ones were formed in this way. This means that these planets and moons have been struck with a lot fewer impacts than evolutionists thought. And that calls into question all those billions of years that these objects have supposedly been around. Remember that Venus's surface looks very young, but its crater supposedly proved as a half billion years old? Now we know this isn't true. And craters are also used to support an old age for the Earth's moon. Supposedly, our moon needed billions of years to accumulate all of its craters. Thanks to Europa, we now know this isn't true. The scientists in this study specifically said the Europa results caused problems for the current accepted age of Earth's moon. Isn't it interesting that one small moon of Jupiter, so far away from us, can wreck evolutionary models of even our own moon? The last moon of Jupiter that we'll be discussing is Io. Compared to Jupiter, Io is an insignificant little speck of a moon. But it's turned out to be one of the most spectacular places in the solar system. Io's surface is covered with volcanoes. All the spots you see on its surface here are volcanic. Over 400 volcanoes have been counted on Io, and at least 150 of them are active today. The black spot you see here is a volcano named Loki. It's more powerful than all the Earth's volcanoes combined. Volcanoes in Io can be incredibly violent. We've seen fountains of lava blasting material 180 miles into space. We've also measured geysers of lava shooting out of the volcanoes at over 2,000 miles per hour. That's more than 10 times as fast as the most violent volcanoes here on Earth. Io gives us some fascinating insights on the long age evolutionary theories. For example, Io puts out twice as much heat as the Earth does. Where does all this heat come from? Well, some of it comes from tidal flexing. Io is caught in a gravitational tug of war between Jupiter on the one side and Jupiter's other large moons on the other. They're both pulling on Io in this squeezing and flexing is generating heat inside Io's interior. The problem is that this squeezing can only account for some of Io's heat. So where does the rest of the heat come from? Well, if Io is young, it could still be cooling off from its initial formation. But if it's really billions of years old, that energy would have dissipated long ago. So, according to evolutionary theory, Io shouldn't have all those active volcanoes you see on its surface, but it does. Io's volcanoes create another problem for the models of billions of years. We've measured the lavas coming from the volcanoes, and there's an amazing amount of it. The Amirani volcano alone, which you see here, is flooding the moon's surface with 100 cubic meters of lava per second. It's erupting like that continuously, and this isn't even the biggest volcano on Io. For example, look at these before and after pictures of the Palan Patera. Between the times these photos were taken, there was a massive eruption that produced the dark spot you see on the upper right. That's a huge lava flow, about as big as the state of Nevada. And these flows happen quickly. We saw a different volcano produce almost this much lava in just two days. Has Io really been erupting like this for four and a half billion years? We've measured some of these flows coming out of these volcanoes, and it's a huge amount of material. If Io really was four and a half billion years old, it would have recycled itself through its own volcanoes over 30 times. Surely Io can't be billions of years old. And there's another problem too. We've studied volcanoes on Earth, and the lavas here reach amazing temperatures, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. At least these temperatures seemed amazing until we examined Io. Evolutionists were flabbergasted with the discovery that some of the lavas on Io are almost 1,000 degrees hotter than Earth lavas. They're also very dense. So here's the problem for evolution. If Io really was billions of years old, these temperatures and densities wouldn't be possible. After the first few million years, Io should have formed a low density crust after all the higher density material sank down to the inside. But there are still high density materials on the surface. Forget about billions of years, Io apparently isn't even millions of years old. Io looks quite young. It matches perfectly with the biblical account of creation just a few thousand years ago. 
And that brings us to the end of our discussion on Jupiter. So let's review. Here's what you're not being told about Jupiter and its moons. According to the secular model, Jupiter can't be made up of the materials it's made up of. In fact, the model can't account for any of the planetesimals that Jupiter was supposedly built from. Therefore, it can't account for the planet itself. Ganymede shouldn't have a magnetic field, but it does. Callisto shouldn't be geologically active, but it is. Europa shows that long-age crater counting methods are wrong, and Io looks very young. Evolutionary models fail utterly to explain Jupiter. That's why evolutionists make complaints like this one. Building Jupiter has long been a problem for theorists. Or this one. I don't think the existence of Jupiter would be predicted if it weren't observed. So why do they still cling to a broken model? Because when you reject the truth, you have to accept a lie. Pity the poor evolutionist who is so committed to a bankrupt theory that he can't see the hand of his creator in this majestic planet. Saturn's rings are one of the most famous sights in all of astronomy. The rings look solid, but they're not. They're actually made up of millions of particles, all orbiting Saturn together. The particles are mostly ice and dirt. Some are as small as grains of dust, others are large boulders. The rings are also razor thin compared to Saturn's bulk. This series of pictures was taken as the Cassini spacecraft moved from below the rings to above them. You can see how thin the rings are. When you compare their width to their thickness, it's about the same as a sheet of paper that's as wide as the city of San Francisco. Oh, and that little guy you saw shooting across the top was one of Saturn's moons. We'll talk about a couple of those in just a few minutes. Saturn's rings are mysterious. They're more than just belts of particles orbiting the planet. For example, there are spokes in them, as you see here. Some of them are even braided. Nobody expected these features in the rings, and some of them are still a puzzle. It's as if somebody created them just to delight and fascinate us. So how do the rings get there? I believe they were created at the same time Saturn was, a few thousand years ago. Of course, evolutionists won't accept this. Here's what a NASA scientist had to say about them. After all this time, we're still not sure about the origin of Saturn's rings, says Jeff Cousy, a planetary scientist at the NASA Ames Research Center. Cousy speculates that some hundreds of millions of years ago, a time when the earliest dinosaurs roamed our planet, Saturn had no bright rings. Then, he says, something unlikely happened. Yes, that's right. Here's Jeff Cousy again. A moon-sized object from the outer solar system might have flown nearby Saturn where tidal forces ripped it apart. Or maybe an asteroid smashed one of Saturn's existing moons. The debris encircled the planet and formed the rings we see today. Are you starting to detect a pattern in evolutionist explanations? Not all evolutionists take refuge in this, though. There's a report from NASA on Saturn's rings that I think is interesting. Here's what it says. Saturn's rings, age and origin unknown. Saturn defies evolutionary models in several ways. For one thing, its magnetic field doesn't match evolutionary predictions at all. As one article explained, Saturn dumbfounded planetary theorists who study dynamo models by having a highly symmetric internal magnetic field. A field that is symmetric about the rotation axis violates a basic theorem of magnetic dynamos. Saturn's magnetic field doesn't seem to be coming from a dynamo. This would be impossible if Saturn were billions of years old, as evolution says. But there's no problem at all if Saturn is only thousands of years old, as the Bible says. But there's an even bigger problem we need to discuss. A recent study took a closer look at the formation of Saturn and Jupiter. Remember that model of the gas and dust cloud that supposedly formed all the planets? Well, the study discovered that Saturn, and Jupiter as well, wouldn't be here today if that model was true. One report on the study described this model and then said this, these theories fail to describe the formation of gas giant planets in a satisfactory way. Gravitational interaction between the gaseous protoplanetary disk and the massive planetary cores causes them to move rapidly inward over about 100,000 years in what we call the migration of the planet in the disk. Theories predict that the giant protoplanets will merge into the central star before planets have time to form. This makes it very difficult to understand how they can form at all. 
Astronomers call this the migration problem. In plain English, Jupiter and Saturn would have both migrated inwards and slammed into the Sun billions of years ago if that whole gas and dust story was true. Since we see Jupiter and Saturn today, obviously the gas and dust story isn't true. The report concluded this way. Understanding the formation of giant planets is currently one of the major challenges for astronomers. If the evolutionary model says that Jupiter and Saturn shouldn't be there, but they are there instead, I'd say that's more than a major challenge for the model. I'd say it falsifies the model completely, wouldn't you? We see then that Saturn creates huge problems for evolution. But we're not done yet. Saturn also has dozens of moons, some of which are fascinating. Let's look at a couple. This is Enceladus one of Saturn's moons. Our first close-up pictures of Enceladus were beautiful, but nobody expected what would come next. When we started taking pictures from a different angle, we saw something unusual. This is Enceladus, below Saturn's rings. Do you see the faint smudge below the moon? A closer look reveals that Enceladus has a fountain coming out of its south pole. When the pictures were colorized to bring out invisible details, we saw that this wasn't just a little spray, it's a huge geyser. Evolutionists were, and still are, stunned by this. Evolutionary models can't explain it. The problem is that Enceladus is supposed to be billions of years old. It's supposed to have cooled off from its formation eons ago. It's not supposed to have the energy to do any of this. Also, we recently took a close look at some of the other moons of Saturn. We found out that Enceladus's neighbors are much brighter than they're supposed to be. Apparently, Enceladus is spray painting them with ice and snow. Evolutionary models say that Enceladus is old, cold, and dead, but it looks like it's none of those things. Enceladus is a great piece of evidence for a young solar system. Then there's Titan. Titan is Saturn's largest moon. This is another great example of how over and over again, evolutionary theories have failed to explain our solar system. Titan is a very unusual moon. As you can see, it looks fuzzy. That's because it has an atmosphere. Titan's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, but it has some methane mixed in. That methane has caused all sorts of problems for evolutionary theories. You see, sunlight breaks methane down. Scientists have calculated that the methane in Titan's atmosphere could only last 10 million years or so, far short of the four and a half billion years that it's supposed to be. However, there's still lots of methane there today. So, if Titan was really billions of years old, it would have two things. Number one, a source of methane to keep replenishing the atmosphere. And number two, a lot of ethane built up on its surface from all the methane that was broken down. Well, a few years ago, the Cassini spacecraft was sent to visit Saturn. It included a special probe to drop onto Titan and investigate this mysterious moon. Because evolutionists believe in billions of years, they confidently predicted we would find a deep global ocean of methane and ethane on Titan. One scientific paper predicted a layer of methane and other chemicals up to 800 meters thick. That's about a half mile deep. One of the leaders of the Titan project went even further. He said, this remarkable moon could be covered by a global ocean of ethane with an average depth of up to several kilometers. However, even before the probe arrived, scientists were taking a closer look at Titan from Earth. They started to realize this prediction was wrong. Then, when Cassini's lander finally penetrated the haze, the truth was confirmed. Despite the evolutionists' expectations, there is no global ocean of methane and ethane on Titan. Titan's surface is dry. All we found is some dark areas on the surface, mostly near the North Pole. These look like lake beds, and it appears that at least some of them are lakes of methane and ethane. However, they're still grossly inadequate to fulfill evolution's requirements. As one recent study commented, even if the dark spots were all lakes of methane, the methane on Titan's surface would only be about one-tenth the amount in the atmosphere. This small amount would last only 10 million years at most, not 4,500 million years. And there's another problem too. Since Titan's surface is solid, according to evolution it should have thousands of craters if it was really billions of years old. Remember how I explained about the crater counting idea? As of the time I'm making this video, the crater counters have thoroughly gone over about 10% of Titan's surface. They haven't found thousands of craters. So far, they've found four. Titan doesn't look billions of years old. Titan looks quite young. 
Titan might be just a moon, but it's a great demonstration of the failure of evolutionary theory. And as we prepare to leave Saturn, I have to tell you about one more thing, actually a pair of things. Here's another wonderful thing from our creator. You're looking at Janus and Epimetheus, two moons of Saturn. You might not think they look very impressive. The thing here isn't how they look, it's what they do. These are now called the dancing moons of Saturn. These two moons orbit Saturn in their separate paths, one on the inside and one on the outside. But then, every four years, they switch. The one on the outside moves to the inside, and the one on the inside moves to the outside. Isn't that wonderful? It's a silent, graceful ballet going on deep in space. This has to be precisely balanced in order to work. What are the odds of this happening by chance? I think this is a great testimony to our Creator. So now we have to leave this part of our tour. Here's what you aren't being told about Saturn. Saturn, and Jupiter too for that matter, can't have formed according to the nebula theory from that cloud of gas and dust. Computer simulations show that both planets would have migrated into the Sun billions of years ago. Saturn's magnetic field doesn't match evolutionary theories. Enceladus is young. Titan is young. And Saturn has dancing moons. Saturn tells us that our Creator is not only skilled, but He appreciates beauty. Uranus is the seventh planet out from our Sun. It's so far away that it takes about 84 Earth years to orbit the Sun once. Because it's so far away from us, we didn't know much about Uranus until the Voyager 2 spacecraft visited it in 1986. Voyager discovered that Uranus defies evolutionary predictions in multiple ways. On the left, you see the planet as it appears to the eye. On the right is the planet with false colors added to exaggerate details. The spot you see here is the planet's south pole. Evolutionists had expected Uranus's poles to be on the top and bottom like all the other planets have. Instead, the poles are on the sides. It turns out that Uranus leans way over as it orbits the Sun. All the other planets spin like a top as they go around the Sun, but not Uranus. Uranus rolls along like a ball as it travels through space. Well, this creates a huge problem for evolution. According to the nebula theory, it's impossible for Uranus to have formed this way. Can you guess what the answer is? Yep, that's right. Uranus formed the right way up, as evolution predicts. But then an asteroid crashed into it and knocked it over. This was a really big asteroid, by the way, about the size of the entire Earth. But where's the evidence for this collision? There isn't any. In fact, there's lots of evidence that seems to be inconsistent with the collision. First of all, Uranus is quite stable as it rolls along through space. Its orbit around the Sun is almost perfectly circular. Plus, its orbit lies more closely within the plane of the ecliptic than any other planet besides Earth. Surely a massive collision wouldn't have produced such a perfect orbit. Also, Uranus has moons, over two dozen of them in fact, as you see here. Plus, it has a faint ring system. Notice that all these moons are orbiting Uranus's equator. Now remember, the equator is angled up and down, instead of sideways like the evolutionists expected. So where did these moons come from? They couldn't have formed before the collision because they wouldn't be orbiting where they are today. And they couldn't have formed after the collision because Uranus was supposedly already formed when the collision occurred. They couldn't even have formed during the collision because their orbits are too regular. They do not look like they were involved in any sort of collision like this. Here's what one scientist said about Uranus's moons. And by the way, this man won the Nobel Prize in physics. He said, to place the Uranian satellites in their present, almost coplanar circular orbits, would require all the trajectory control sophistication of modern space technology. It is unlikely that any natural phenomenon involving bodies emitted from Uranus could have achieved this result. I think we should recognize that no collision occurred. Uranus was apparently created just the way it is. Uranus causes lots of other problems for evolution too. First of all, Uranus is one of the four giant Jovian planets. The other three all generate energy. They radiate more energy into space than they receive from the Sun. Uranus is the only giant planet that doesn't do this. But why doesn't it? After all, these planets all supposedly formed at the same time, from the same materials, by the same natural processes. That means they should have turned out roughly the same. 
but Uranus is very different than the others in this important area. Another problem was discovered when Voyager flew by Uranus and measured the planet's magnetic field. Evolutionists had predicted that Uranus wouldn't have a magnetic field, but it does. Now, creationists weren't surprised when Uranus was found to have a magnetic field. Two years before the Voyager probe reached Uranus, Dr. Russell Humphreys, who is a Bible-believing physicist, had predicted the planet would have a magnetic field. Since the Bible says the Earth was made of water, Dr. Humphreys said, what if all the planets were originally created from water? That would have certain implications for their magnetic fields today, 6,000 years later. So he calculated approximately how strong that field would be today. And when Voyager reached Uranus and took measurements, the evolutionists were wrong, and the creation-based prediction was right. There's more we could say about Uranus if we had the time. But before we leave this planet, I have to share with you one of my favorite objects in the solar system, Uranus's moon, Miranda. Miranda is a tiny little moon. It's only about 300 miles across, but it's one of the strangest objects in the solar system. Pity the poor evolutionist who has to explain this thing. The entire moon looks like a patchwork quilt, like it was glued together from a jumble of different pieces. How many different types of terrain can you identify here? There's long strips of rugged terrain, side by side with terrain that's smoother but more heavily cratered. Here's another example. Look at how dramatically the terrain changes from one section to another. It really looks like the moon was assembled from a bunch of separate pieces. Some sections look like someone painted it with a giant paintbrush. Other sections have very dramatic terrain, with canyons several miles deep. Let's look more closely at that cliff on the right. This cliff is about six miles high. Imagine standing at the top and looking down. And what's with that big check mark anyway? It's almost as if the creator said, ha, let him try to explain this one. As one evolutionist said, no one predicted anything looking like Miranda. Another said, the central problem in modeling the thermal histories of the Uranian satellites is accounting for Miranda. So how do evolutionists explain Miranda? You're probably expecting me to say they explain it with an asteroid collision. Nope, not this time. Miranda is so weird, even the evolutionists admit that an asteroid collision won't help them. Instead, some evolutionists propose five collisions. Here's a quote from a NASA website. Scientists believe that Miranda may have been shattered as many as five times during its evolution. After each shattering, the moon would have reassembled from the remains of its former self with portions of the core exposed and portions of the surface buried. If this sounds like nonsense, it's because it is. Even other evolutionists recognize that this tiny moon wouldn't necessarily survive one collision, never mind five. As one evolutionary astronomer wrote, although some sort of collisional disruption appears to be required, it's not obvious that the present terrain, with relief up to 20 kilometers, would survive catastrophic disruption and reassembly. Maybe that's why that NASA website, after telling you about the five collisions, says this. Miranda's appearance can be explained by theories, but the real reason is still unknown. So first, they give you a theory, and then admit they actually don't know what happened. In other words, they made up a story and told it to you, even though they know it's not true. Wouldn't it be better just to acknowledge that these objects were created? So here's what you're not being told about Uranus. Evolution says it shouldn't be rotating sideways, but it is. Evolution says it shouldn't have its current magnetic field, but it does. Evolution says it should be radiating energy into space, but it isn't. And Miranda is a complete mystery. Neptune is the eighth planet out from our sun. It's so far out in the solar system that the light from our sun takes over four hours to reach it. According to evolutionary models, Neptune is old, cold, and dead. It's supposedly billions of years old after all. But unfortunately for evolutionary models, Neptune doesn't look either old, cold, or dead. First of all, Neptune isn't cold. Yes, it's a colder place than Earth. But our space probes have discovered that it's not as cold as evolutionists expected. Instead, the planet radiates into space about twice the energy it receives from the sun. Neptune isn't dead either. It turns out Neptune is a violent, turbulent place. It has the strongest winds measured anywhere in the solar system. We've measured wind speeds there up to 1300 miles per hour. 
This is called the Great Dark Spot. It's a massive storm system roughly the size of Earth, or at least it was. A few years after this photograph was taken by Voyager in 1989, NASA took more pictures of Neptune with the Hubble Space Telescope. The new photographs showed that the dark spot has disappeared. Since then, a new one has been discovered in a different location. Neptune is a dynamic, ever-changing planet. Neptune looks neither cold nor dead. Apparently, it's not old either. Neptune also confounds evolutionary theories with its magnetic field. We've seen that over and over again, the magnetic fields in the solar system have falsified evolutionary models. Well, Neptune is no different. We had a hint of the problem already before our first spacecraft even reached Neptune. When Voyager 2 was on its way to Neptune, it visited Uranus first. I already told you that according to evolution, Uranus wasn't supposed to have much of a magnetic field, but it does. There was another surprise, though, that I didn't mention. Not only was Uranus's magnetic field much stronger than the evolutionists expected, it was also tilted and offset from the center of the planet. Evolutionists couldn't make sense of this at all. It doesn't match their models at all. So they scratched their heads and said, well, maybe Voyager flew by just as Uranus's magnetic field was reversing. This would have been very unlikely, although not impossible. But then, three years later, Voyager arrived at Neptune, and guess what? Neptune's magnetic field is also tilted and offset from the planet's center. Evolutionists were forced to acknowledge that it seems that the possibility of finding two planets both experiencing magnetic polarity reversals is small. So far, we've seen that Neptune has produced lots of bad news for the evolutionary model. But there's an even bigger problem that I haven't told you about yet. According to evolutionary models, Neptune can't exist at all. Here's how Astronomy Magazine explained it. Psst. Astronomers who model the formation of a solar system have kept a dirty little secret. Uranus and Neptune don't exist. Or at least computer simulations have never explained how planets as big as the two gas giants could form so far from the Sun. Bodies orbited so slowly in the outer parts of the Sun's protoplanetary disk that the slow process of gravitational accretion would need more time than the age of the solar system to form bodies with 14 and a half and 17.1 times the mass of Earth. Did you catch that? According to evolution, Uranus and Neptune don't exist. Well, last time I checked, both planets were still up there in the sky. Evolutionists are unhappy that their model is such a failure. As one evolutionary astronomer has commented, what is clear is that simple banging together of planetesimals to construct planets takes too long in this remote outer part of the solar system. The time needed exceeds the age of the solar system. We see Uranus and Neptune, but the modest requirement that these planets exist has not been met by this model. Let's ask an important question here. How long has this problem been known? Here's another evolutionist. There have been many attempts to model the evolution of a swarm of colliding planetesimals. Safranov calculated the characteristic timescales for planetary growth. In the terrestrial region, he found timescales of 10 to the 7 years. That's the one with seven zeros after it. But the time estimates increased rapidly in the outer regions of the solar system and was 10 to the 10 years for Neptune, which is twice the age of the solar system. It is clear that in view of the large timescales found for the formation of the outer planets, a satisfactory theoretical model for the accretion of planets from diffuse material is not available at present. Okay, so this problem was first discovered by a scientist named Safranov. Was this a recent discovery? Nope. Safranov published this in 1972. So evolutionists have known for over 30 years that Uranus and Neptune can't exist according to their models. Did you hear about this in Time Magazine? or in the newspaper, or in a science program? I bet you haven't. In fact, I bet you've been told the opposite. I bet you've been told that evolutionists have the entire solar system figured out, and that they know exactly how it all formed all by itself billions of years ago. Now you know that this is a falsehood. Here's a quote from another evolutionary astronomer. He says this, It's clear that our level of sophistication of studying planet formation is relatively primitive. So far, it's been very difficult for anybody to come up with a scenario that actually produces Uranus and Neptune. Come up with a scenario. That's a very interesting statement. In fact, it really reveals the heart of the matter. The goal of the evolutionist is to come up with a scenario about how everything got here without a creator being involved. Most evolutionists even seem to believe that just the act of coming up with a story proves it all happened that way. It doesn't even have to be a good story. Just look at what's going on with Uranus and Neptune. Instead of acknowledging their creator, evolutionists would rather cling to a story that denies the very objects it's supposed to explain. 
Evolutionists need to make up stories about how evolution could have made the planets. How much worse of a story could you come up with than one that says the planets can't exist? Uranus and Neptune prove that it doesn't matter how bad the story is. For the evolutionist, any story is better than acknowledging the truth about their creator. These planets reveal the truth about the creation versus evolution debate. This is not a debate about religion versus science. If it were, there wouldn't be any scientists who believed in creation. But there are hundreds of degreed scientists who do believe in creation. No, this is a debate about the authority of the Bible as God's word. The Bible explains the scientific data far better than the evolutionary model. Plus, the Bible's truth is supported by evidence from archaeology, geology, history, and many other sources. Not to mention that as the word of God, the Bible stands on its own authority anyway. But none of that matters to evolutionists. Evolutionists have rejected the Bible because they don't want to be accountable to a creator. They would rather believe a model that says the gas giant planets cannot exist. You can decide for yourself whose model is the better match for the scientific evidence. So here's what you're not being told about Neptune. It looks young, not billions of years old. It generates energy, it's changing constantly, and it has the most violent winds in the entire solar system. Its magnetic field defies evolutionary models. And the biggest problem is this. According to evolution, it can't be there at all. This is the last stop in our tour of the solar system. We're now out even beyond Neptune. You might have expected this last section to focus on Pluto. Well, it won't for several reasons. Number one, we don't know much about Pluto. Our best photographs are only as good as this. This is Pluto and its moon. So that's the first reason. The second is that, as you might have heard, many astronomers no longer consider Pluto to be a planet. We've discovered that there are other similar objects out there in the same neighborhood. One that was recently discovered is even believed to be slightly bigger than Pluto. So Pluto doesn't look so unique anymore, and it's now being recognized as just one among many objects out there beyond Neptune. Since they're beyond Neptune, we call these trans-Neptunian objects, or TNOs for short. TNOs are much farther away from us than anything else in our solar system. If you were standing on one of them, our sun would be so far away, it would appear to be just a bright star. Yet even these tiny chunks of rock and ice, so far away from us, have something to say about creation and evolution. First of all, where did TNOs come from? Supposedly, TNOs are the leftovers from that big cloud of gas and dust that evolutionists believe in. They're asteroids that never formed into planets. That would make them billions of years old, right? Well, evolution runs into problems already, because the more we learn about TNOs, the less they look like they're billions of years old. Scientists have recently discovered that many of the TNOs have fresh ice on them. The material apparently came from volcanic eruptions. But if these little rocks were really billions of years old, they wouldn't be geologically active anymore. They don't have any sources of internal heat, and they certainly don't get much from the sun. The temperatures out there are about 370 degrees below zero. So if they really were billions of years old, they would have frozen solid eons ago. They wouldn't have any volcanoes left anymore. But apparently they do have volcanoes. Apparently, they're not billions of years old after all. But that's not the only evidence for a young creation that TNOs and other objects give us. Let's talk about a group of objects that are among the most spectacular in all the universe. Comets. When a large comet appears in the sky, it can be a breathtaking sight. But what are these objects? Comets are usually described as big, dirty snowballs flying through space. During most of its orbit, a comet doesn't look very exciting. But when it gets close enough to the sun, it heats up, and the ices begin to sublimate into gas. The gas streams out beyond the comet as it flies through space forming the beautiful tail that we see from Earth. But there's more here than just beauty. A comet burns up and loses material each time it passes by the sun. It gets smaller and smaller each time. Eventually, it will be so small that it will break up into fragments. We've actually seen this process happen with several dozen comets now. Comets can also be destroyed by crashing into the sun or a planet. For example, we saw the Shoemaker-Levy comet break up and hit Jupiter a few years ago. The marks you see here on Jupiter were caused by the comet's fragments smashing into the planet. 
Comets can even be thrown out of the solar system completely, thanks to gravitational interaction with other objects. So when you see a comet, remember that it's beautiful, but it's also temporary. This has caused a real challenge for evolutionary models. We see lots of comets today, but they can't have been there for billions of years. Comets can't last that long. Evolutionists are stuck here. Their models say that new comets haven't been formed since the early history of the solar system, billions of years ago. At the same time, they need a supply of new comets to replace the ones that are constantly being destroyed. To solve this problem, they believe that there are billions of comets, or comet nuclei, as they're called, that are left over from the formation of the solar system. These nuclei orbit the sun at vast distances away. They've never been heated up by the sun at all. They've stayed cold and frozen for billions of years. It's only once in a while that something will happen, a star passing by our solar system, for example. The star disturbs one or more of the comet nuclei and nudges them into orbits closer to the sun. At that point, they turn into normal comets with shortened lifespans. So where are all these nuclei? Evolutionists believe that they're in two different places, the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. Evolutionary models need both of these sources to explain comets, and recent discoveries have disproved both of them. We'll start with the so-called Oort cloud, named after the astronomer who first invented this idea. He figured that there must be a huge cloud of comet nuclei way out in a large sphere-shaped cloud surrounding the solar system. The Oort cloud has three major problems. Number one, it's never been seen. As the late astronomer Carl Sagan wrote, many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution. Yet there is not yet a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. Why hasn't anybody ever seen it? Because according to evolutionary models, it's impossible to see it or measure it because it's too far away. You just have to accept it on faith and believe it exists. Remember that the next time somebody challenges you for believing in creation, because it's religious and not scientific. The evolutionary model actually requires more faith than the creation model. Anyway, that's problem number one with the Oort cloud. Problem number two was just discovered recently. The evolutionary model says that comets originally formed in the TNO region, which is why we're talking about comets now in the TNO part of our tour. But the Oort cloud is supposedly much farther out than that and surrounds the sun in a huge sphere. How did all the comets get way out there? Evolutionists used to think that the comets migrated out there after they formed, but scientists have now realized this is impossible. It turns out that in the evolutionary model, there would be a lot of collisions along the way, and few comet nuclei would survive the trip. They'd be smashed into powder instead. The Oort cloud, even if it did exist, would have far too few comet nuclei. It couldn't supply the comets that evolutionists need for their billions of years. Problem number three is that many comets couldn't have come from an Oort cloud. These comets are called short period comets because they orbit the sun in a short period of time, 200 years or less. Short period comets don't last long. As I mentioned earlier, they can only go around the sun a certain number of times before they're destroyed or leave the solar system completely. A maximum lifespan for a short period comet has been estimated to be 10,000 years or less. Obviously, if the solar system was really billions of years old, we wouldn't see these comets anymore, unless there was a constant supply of new ones coming in to replace the old. However, a few years ago, evolutionists realized that the Oort cloud couldn't supply them. Short period comets have certain orbital characteristics that make it impossible for them to have come from an Oort cloud, which is way out there in space. So, most evolutionists today also believe in something called the Kuiper belt. This would be a disk of comet nuclei orbiting out beyond Neptune in the TNO region that we've been talking about. Again, these have been sitting out there quietly for billions of years, but every once in a while, one of them gets disturbed, moves in closer to the sun, and turns into a comet. Therefore, says the evolutionist, it's no problem that we still see short period comets today. Yes, they only last for a few thousand years once they start orbiting closer to the sun, but there's an endless supply waiting out beyond Neptune to keep replenishing them. Unfortunately for evolution, recent discoveries have shown the Kuiper belt model doesn't work any better than the Oort cloud did. First of all, NASA and other space agencies have been busy in the last few years studying comets. We've actually visited several comets with spacecraft. We sent the Deep Impact spacecraft to crash a probe into a comet called Temple 1 to see what we could learn about the comet's structure. 
In an even more amazing feat, the Stardust spacecraft recently visited the Vilt-2 comet. The probe actually flew through the comet's tail, collected material from it, and brought it back to Earth. Evolutionists were shocked when they examined this material. Remember, in the evolutionists' story, comets were formed in the outer reaches of the solar system. The evolutionary model says that things that formed way out there must contain certain elements and must not contain certain other elements. Well, we've discovered that comets aren't like this. The volatile materials that evolutionists expected to find in the comet's tail were either rare or non-existent. On the other hand, most of the material was made up of silicates that the evolutionary model says can't have been out there where comets were supposedly born. So in many ways, comets have turned out to be the direct opposite of what the evolutionary model predicted. But there's another problem too. The Hubble Space Telescope was recently used in a massive search for comet nuclei to confirm that they're actually there. The search was the biggest study that anybody had ever done of the TNO region so far out there in space. Evolutionists expected to find about 85 comet nuclei in the region they searched. How many did they actually find? Only three. This has massive implications. Even the scientists in charge of the project admitted that this is serious trouble for the overall idea of comet nuclei out there. These results mean that the number of comet nuclei is at least hundreds and possibly even thousands of times less than the number required for supplying short period comets. The project's report said that the number of nuclei found was, quote, wildly inconsistent, unquote, with what evolutionists had expected. This means that evolutionists have no source for short period comets. Therefore, they can't explain how we still see comets today after billions of years, even though these comets burn up after only thousands of years. Maybe it's because the solar system isn't really billions of years old. Hmm. Here's what you aren't being told about comets and TNOs. The TNOs we see look young, not old. The comet material that we've sampled contradicts the evolutionary model. And comets shouldn't be here anymore if the solar system were really billions of years old. Comets are not only among the most beautiful objects in astronomy, they also reveal the utter bankruptcy of evolutionary models. In this video, you've seen how the planets, moons, and other objects in our solar system have falsified evolution over and over again. Some evolutionists will even admit this is true. One astrophysics textbook talks about the solar nebula model and then says this, we have seen that we know very little about the development of the solar system. Another evolutionary astronomer said this, to sum up, I think that all suggested accounts of the origin of the solar system are subject to serious objections. The conclusion in the present state of the subject would be that the system cannot exist. This is the best that evolutionary theory can come up with. Our solar system cannot exist. So the next time you hear about some amazing new discovery that confirms evolution again, remember what you've learned in this video. Remember that you're never told the entire story about these models. Remember that they tell you that they have it all figured out when in reality, the system cannot exist. The more we learn about our solar system, the more we realize how bankrupt evolutionary theory is. On the other hand, the Bible has stood firm the entire time. The more we learn about astronomy, the more we wonder at the beauty and majesty of God's creation. Of course, we learn more about space all the time. Not only that, evolutionists are always changing their models. So I've set up a special website to track the latest information on creation evidences in astronomy. It's at www creationastronomy.com. As we conclude, you might be wondering about something. In this video, we've discussed the planets and moons in our solar system. But what about our sun? Or the other stars in our galaxy? Or the Milky Way galaxy itself? Or the billions of other objects that we see in space? Can evolution explain any of these objects? No, it can't. We've discovered that they falsify evolution just as much as the planets and moons of our solar system do but we'll save all of that for volume two in this video series. Until then, I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the solar system. And remember that truly, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Thank you.